Um, so as Lynn already um, introduced, uh, we're here for the We Present um, Stuff They Don't Tell You series. Today's edition, the last one in the series, is How to Make a Difference. And I'm joined by some wonderful panelists today. Um, and we're going to have a little bit of a chat about how working in the creative industries, you can really create impact with your work um, and the challenges there, and also learn a little bit more about their stories and their experience. Um, as the event description says, um, we want to explore how creativity can overturn unfair policies, reduce inequality, and build communities across the globe under common causes. Um, and a few weeks ago, we had a fireside chat here with Kimberly Emerson from Human Rights Watch, um, and she pulled out a really interesting quote um, saying about how art is making the invisible visible. And I think with that in mind, um, we can enter this conversation about how creativity um, can start interesting conversations and kind of create some impact. Um, so I'm now going to introduce our panelists for the evening. Um, so first up, we have Aisha Hussain, who's a freelancer in the creative world, hopping between London and Berlin in her pursuit to place diversity and inclusion at the core of everything she does. Currently working in the film and music industries, Aisha works on freelance projects in varying capacities, from writing and copy editing to communications and developing inclusive recruitment strategies. Thank you for joining us. Um, Sandira Blas is a Berlin-based strategic advisor with over 20 years of international experience working within the music, technology, and startup ecosystems. Um, in 2017, she was one of 10 artists and innovators selected in Germany for Key Change, an international program that empowers talented, underrepresented genders to transform the future of the music industry and help accelerate change to create a better, more inclusive music industry. Um, both Aisha and Sandira are involved in Key Change. Um, hopefully, we'll hear a little bit more about that today. Um, and sitting next to me, we have Richard, uh, the co-founder of Berlin-based radio station Refuge Worldwide, an independent community radio station working in solidarity with grassroots and non-profit organizations. He's also the founder of Kynet Records, a label for techno, experimental, and dub music. So some really busy, amazing people uh, join me on stage today. Thanks so much for coming. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so I think as a starting point to kind of contextualize um, the conversation a little bit further, um, I'd like to ask, from your perspective, why do you think it's important that in this day and age we use our voices and our platform for good, for creating impact? Um, maybe, Rich, do you want to start us off there? Yeah, uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's really nice to be here and speak to you all. Uh, why is it important to use our voice in today's day and age? I guess in uh, my case, or in our cases, we all broadly work in music and surrounding fields. I suppose it feels most important now compared to a few years ago because the scene uh, feels like it is listening and reacting to these issues far better and far quicker than it has been in years before. And even though there's, like, there's still a long way to go in that on all fronts, um, you know, finally, people in positions of influence and power are, I mean, some of them are listening because they want to and they agree with the points being raised. Others are listening because it makes business sense. But either way, the, um, these kind of, this change can happen at a much quicker rate and is happening at a more profound sort of level because, um, yeah, due to just kind of global changes in perception and, you know, I think events that we're all aware of in the last years, um, uh, yeah, there's a much higher level of accountability in the scene and what people expect and what people will tolerate. So now, you know, where you might used to be shouting into a vacuum about what you think needs to change, you know, now you say things and you really actually see uh, tangible changes happen, uh, sometimes fast, sometimes they take a lot longer, but, you know, w with that kind of that positive reinforcement that these things are changing is just an extra reminder to ourselves that when you have the opportunity and the platform to do that, that is so important that you do so, you know, for to make things better now and for future generations. For sure, like ride that wave of momentum. Um, what, what do you think, Aisha? Um, I mean, 
I completely uh, agree, obviously, with uh, Richard here, but also it's been quite interesting to see, you know, the technological developments and, you know, social media's, you know, allowed, you know, I've benefited myself as well, and I'm sure a lot of people here have, the voices that we didn't hear or have access to even like seven, five, seven years ago, and, you know, intertwined with the political movements that we've been seeing in recent years, um, and then having that platform and space um, to also create your own communities as well and you know I always craved uh, you know my own community you know as a as a as a an immigrant child uh, growing up in London we didn't have access in um, in a sort of in a what am I looking for uh, sort of the visual sense the visual representation you know whether it's on TV or you know music a film um, and I think that that's completely changed just seeing how the uh, Gen X uh, sorry G Generation Z if you like um, how they've used those tools as well to really create their own spaces I'm quite envious as well it's like I wish I was a 20 something year old um, but yeah that's also been really incredible uh, to see and yeah it's it's a duty I feel to use that space and platform and to engage with people and take advantage of these things that we never had before totally yeah yeah um for me i think it's important to use our voices <clears throat> because um we're kind of the new we're at an advantage with social media we're, we're the new media outlet you know back in the day i'm a gen x <laughs> so um i've seen so many changes in the past 20 years um the change um you know, speaking up and changing colonialism in these uh, old traditions and these old approaches that uh, Gen X and before me, um, this is their way of life uh, and thoughts. Um, so I think, you know, speaking, we're the new media, you know, and uh, I don't have to count on CNN anymore. Now I can count on Richard's uh, platform, you know, or, or through Aisha's uh, Key Change or, you know, anywhere else. Yeah, I guess so. The idea that that's the right time that people are ready to hear it, but the channels also for the for, for that exist for that conversation. Speaking of which, I mean, you kind of teased there, Sandero. Maybe you can give us a little bit more of an insight into the projects you're working on um, towards this effect. Rich, maybe you go first. Tell us a bit about Refuge. Uh, yeah, so we have a radio station and a bar and a studio in Weserstrasse, Neukölln, so not far from here, which you're all warmly welcome to come and visit us at. Um, we are broadcasting live 24-7, uh, but live from the studios six days a week. And the other day, Mondays, we just have the studio um, free for people to come and practice or learn. Um, we're also doing a lot of workshops, you know, weekly workshops. There's always free to attend as well, whether that's DJ workshops or other kinds of media and um, other things as well, microphone building or uh, sound healing, all kinds of stuff. Um, and it really works around this uh, well, firstly, it works around an amazing team of people that we have at the radio station. But I, I kind of struggle to call it a radio station because it's a very broad term and uh, there's different things going on. But yeah, we have a team there who are doing amazing work and also a, like a wider team of residents and people who just come down to the bar. And among us all, we've, yeah, we create uh, quite an extensive sort of program of um, workshops, music, discussion, and also just a, create a place for people to come, um, come on their own, sit down, talk to someone, and uh, you never know what kind of professional or personal um, relationship is gonna come out of that. And yeah, they're also doing events around, in Berlin and around the world, uh, some editorial, and just always trying to tie these things in um, to the issues we care about, the music we love, and the people we want to kind of lift up along the way. How would you define the issues that you care about? Like, what are the kind of topics that you're handling as, as, as a community? Uh, there's a lot of stuff about um, identity, migration, uh, the environment, also some very local Berlin things to do with uh, housing, for example. Um, and. Yeah, I mean, then the the music is really broad as well. Um, obviously, being in Berlin, there's a lot of DJs, a lot of electronic music, but we try and keep that to uh, keep a lid on that a little bit because there's obviously so much else out there. So um, yeah, we really try and make it 
as broad as possible and whenever someone comes with an idea, however you know, mad it may sound at the beginning, to always just try and listen and give space to that. Um, it's obviously not always possible given the hours in the day, but um, just really try and make a platform for other people to create rather than we creating. Awesome. Um, Aisha, maybe you can also share some of the projects or things that you're working on. Uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the Key Change uh, project. So it is a creative Europe-funded project, and um, it was uh, conceived in 2018, where the world was also quite a different uh, place then. Um, so it's a primar primarily a gender parity project uh, in the music industry. Um, so it started off with uh, with the it, it, was, it has multiple sides to it, so I'll try and condense it in uh, as, as concise as possible. So um, the first aspect is the um, the uh, Key Change uh, Talent Development Program. Uh, we're in our uh, third and final uh, selection year at the moment, uh, where we select 74 women and gender minority um, music professionals and artists who um, have found it difficult to move on in their careers because of the uh, gender barriers in the industry. And we have uh, multiple partner uh, festivals across Europe and two in Canada. Um, so Rupert Festival in uh, Hamburg are the lead uh, lead partner festival and what happens within the talent development program is that there are opportunities to showcase if you're a music industry professional you know having uh, sort of like a platform or uh, panel opportunities and uh, a place to network and also build community and it's uh, for me just to also like witness firsthand how fruitful that has been uh, for also uh, both on a national and international level there's been um, you know I'm constantly hearing uh, our participants talk about how, you know, they didn't even know that people existed in their own uh, country or the city that they could collaborate with. And also on top of that, you have the cross-border collaborations as well. Um, and, uh, you know, through that, you build a, a community and a network that uh, also works to, you know, shatter those glass ceilings and, uh, and also the realization that it has to be not just the top or the bottom, it has to be a simultaneous sort of at all levels, we have to work towards gender parity, which leads me on to the second part of it, which is the Key Change uh, Pledge, that um, festivals, uh, bookers, labels, uh, any music or organizations can sign up to, um, where you pick an area within your organization, maybe you want to bring your gender balance, you know, 50% gender balance in your artist roster or in your board as well, and, and really look to putting in those targets in place to work, you know, giving yourself a time frame to m reach those targets and realizing that it's, you know, it has to be across the board. So, and that stemmed from, I don't know if anyone remembers back in, uh, I think 2015, um, if anyone remembers the uh, Reading uh, poster and they took away all the, uh, uh, they just left, like, there was like, three acts in the whole poster that were either had, you know, one woman or, you know, that's pretty shameful. Uh, but yeah, so that's the second part of it. And also there's a third element as well. There's a, sorry, it's, um, so it's uh, taking it to also EU level. So looking uh, to sort of develop that on a legislative level as well, which is also crucial and important to implement these things, you know, formally as well to make sure that those changes happen and filter throughout. Amazing. Um, Sandira, I know you're also working as part of Key Change, but you've been part here at Factory really driving um, kind of yeah, using creative industries to, to create impact. Um, what kind of projects that you've worked on would you say have kind of been the most impactful or that you're the most proud of uh, that you've been part of? Um, yeah, I actually worked at Factory, um, but I left in the end of February to, and I still work with them sort of in a, in a sense, um, doing partnerships. Um, I guess something that it really was amazing for me, a great experience, was an artist residency that I helped found here at Factory in this lab in the back, um, where we had over 100 participants almost uh, of mentors and artists um, from across different disciplines and uh, genres of creative industries. Um, the point of it was to, to gather different diverse voices from different cultures, um, different countries, and they all came together here. Um, exploring together and intersecting their works in AI, in GAN, 
brands in AR and um, AI and music. Um, and then there is a lot of, um, of these creators that amazed me. They went and have done World Economic Forum talks, um, TED talks, like official TED, TED not TEDx. Um, and they have um, founded businesses together. Uh, when I saw that, it's just like, it really is like such a joy and it felt like very fulfilling to do something like that. Whereas when I left Factory, I actually am doing that now for a company, Transmoderna, where we get to build an artist hub um, in Berlin and in different places around the world where we can build kind of like, it's like a tech stars, but for creatives, um, like an accelerator program. And yeah, now as an independent freelancer, I get to work with artists and brands and I'm working um, with artists and brands um, so brands that you know have impact, um, like Grover, we're working with now with Transmoderna, um, and you know for a greener environment and society, uh, accessible creative tech because um, it's never going to go away. But yeah, like the residencies is something that I, I do now, also independently, and um, is super fulfilling to see these people come together and create together and still collaborate right now to this day. Amazing. I think there's like quite a few different ways that the three of you are, are bridging the creative industry and, and impact. Um, so maybe also you could share a little bit about your story of how you, you got into it, I think, whether it's like starting your own project or joining an organization where you can be a part of. Um, yeah, how did you kind of get those first steps off the, off the ground? Like maybe you're working in the creative space and you see that there's a need, there's something you want to do, but like how do, how do you kind of get the ball rolling? Um, Maybe Sandira, do you want yeah. to start this time? Um, I was actually a member here before, <laughs> um, and then I was asked to come on by your CEO, Martin Iyer, um, to test out a space. Um, and I used your platform to to do these um, projects and book artists and speakers um, uh, with zero dollars. Um, so I used my background in music tech because um, I came from a company in the past, Akai Pro, and they own. 20 different music tech brands and um, help get products and help also artists get products and um, to collaborate with those brands as well. Um, so I felt like I had to run a startup as well within a startup surrounded by startups. And I learned a lot through the community here um, <clears throat> how to raise funding and successfully was able to raise um, like almost a half a million or more um, in European funding and through other partners like Sonar Festival and um, through, for other artists. Um, and to use other platforms through us, so they would go and you know do stuff with uh, Sonar or Ars Electronica, or um, and learn also how to get funding as well. Um, and like we're talking about big funding, and also how to pitch to brands um, and win win these kind of projects. So there's a lot about like network and kind of yeah, using the absolutely. community around you. Yeah, and the community here definitely encouraged it. It just like um, I learned a lot from seeing, you know, even Audi and McKinsey and people at SoundCloud, and was able to collaborate with the people at Hands Reach and just ask them um, and tell, talk to them, you know, and just have a coffee. And yeah, I think there's a lot of communities like that here um, where you can get that kind of support, and you know, you just ask the right people and design your environment. Uh, Rich, how did Refuge come to life in its kind of current iteration? How did you, you build that? Uh, well, Refuge was actually a, a charity party or a solly party for five years before it became Refuge Worldwide, which is a radio station. So that was run by George Patrick, who's the other co-founder of the radio. And um, yeah, I guess in the pandemic, when he was done with running parties for that moment or not able to, then had the idea to start a radio station and asked me if I would like to partner with him. Um, and it was a really, yeah, it was obviously a kind of complicated moment to start something like that, but in a way it was actually quite a good moment for us because people were really after something new to interact with and a lot of people had time on their hands to also make radio shows, to learn a new skill and this kind of thing. So, I mean, it, to start a radio station, I would say the actual, um, the things you need to do to have some sort of radio station is pretty uh, accessible and easy. You know, there's software that you that you can use online for, in some cases, free or not too expensive. So you need um, music and some kind of basic website. So that part is um, is really kind of democratized and accessible. I think turning it from there into uh, a business that can support you 
that, that was the more um, the more difficult part, I guess, and to support you and others. Um, and that was, yeah, we did a crowdfunder at the beginning to open the space, and in the space we opened a bar, and from there things just kind of moved forward to a place where we're now able to, you know, employ people and support people. Awesome. And Aisha, how did you kind of get involved in Key Change? How did you get your feet in that? Um, on a sort of like more personal uh, level, <clears throat> for say for um, 10 years but before I moved to Berlin, I, uh, I worked in film. I actually struggled uh, to uh, find a space in the music industry actually um, as a woman, as a brown woman, not getting taken seriously. You know, I'd do a whole host of like music journalism, both print and online, but you know, you have to pay the bills. Uh, so end up in, in film by accident and that was fine. I moved to uh, Berlin where opportunity was a quite a different space. I think it, it, Berlin allows a space for you to explore that did, didn't, for me anyway, exist in, in London. And uh, it was, again, it's about networking and community and uh, a, a friend just sent me, uh, her words were just, I shall have the perfect job for you because I'm all about like gender and gender parity and inclusion and intersectionalism and all about music. So, yeah, and uh, when I yeah when I read the uh, you know what the project was about and uh, yeah I thought that's I want that job and yeah and then I ended up in it and uh, yeah it's just been a really interesting uh, personal journey for me as well, because it also uh, ties in with uh, what I do at Film London, uh, the other uh, place at London's Film Commission, where I work uh, with my other hat, uh, the other half of the week, um, around uh, diversity and inclusion within uh, the workplace and, you know, not being a tick box exercise. And I guess for me as well is, uh, you know, when we talk also about like things like outreach and getting to like uh, communities, um, I want to, I want there to be what I never got to see that all those years ago. So for me, it's like finding those, also using those tools, uh, tools from key change that I've learned as well and vice versa and how I can also uh, use my learning learnings and to create space in, in both areas and in my everyday life as well. So that's kind of been my my personal journey, so to speak. That's really interesting. That's also a perfect segue to my next question, which is like, what kind of learnings have you taken then from becoming part of Key Change that you say you, you take into other areas of your work? Um, yeah, what maybe you can share some of those insights? Yeah, one of the... <sighs> most humbling things about it has been the uh, international collaborations and going to all the, um, so just as an ex off the top of my head, uh, like we have a partner, our country, partner countries are like Estonia, um, Italy, Spain, UK, Canada, Norway, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a couple of others, um, and just how different the gender talk itself is, for instance. Um, and I'm also, it got me thinking as a native English speaker as well, uh, the uh, sort of colonization of language and ideas and not to expect uh, countries to be at the same air quotes level as you know oneself uh, you know I, I feel quite privileged to have both the London and Berlin experience Berlin is so ahead in terms of the gender sexuality talks uh, of most cities London is way ahead in the race talks uh, so I can use both of those things and also when you do step into other spaces you have to be respectful of the language uh, barriers as well when we t you know that's an added barrier to how we talk about things you know if there isn't I remember once uh, you know talking about intersectionalism I in the arts if if intersectionalism in your local language that term doesn't exist how do you talk about a term that doesn't exist and yeah all, th all these things just always play at the back of my mind and I've also started to develop uh, my own you know I have a sort of European English that I speak versus uh you know, it, it, code switching basically is what it is in a, in a, in a sense. Um, so yeah, those are, m are my specific learnings and also um, how you can be inclusive and respectful when you step into these spaces um, because, you know, that's what collaboration is, being respectful as well and exchange of ideas and, uh, and yeah, so that's my take. Awesome. 
Um, what kind of advice would you give people who are looking to create impact through their work? If they're working in the creative industries or they're looking to, to do so, what kind of advice maybe would you share with someone? Maybe Sandira? <coughs> Um, for me, I'm a mentor and a mentee, and I think it's really important you find someone that knows uh, is way in advanced, maybe perhaps in the field that you're interested in. Um, I, I also speak to a lot of people doing creative startups to have creative advisors on board. Um, I think having building this community and people that support whatever you believe in um, is uh, is the best advice. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm always surrounding myself around people that are, are freaking amazing and that inspire me, and I have to continually do that every day, um, or else I'm working alone um, and stuck in my own ways. Um, but, you know, having different voices and different cultures, um, bringing in their perspectives um, and advice is, um, yeah, the best advice, I guess you can say. Cool. Rich? Um, I think I would encourage people to really look at sort of making a change on any level as uh, a success, whether that's just helping one person um, or it's helping a thousand or ten thousand or a million people. It doesn't necessarily matter on which of those levels you're working. It's just still just as valuable. And um, yeah, some of the projects we do at the radio, some of them are kind of more broader reaching uh, for numerous people and kind of uh, extended uh, maybe courses or something and I, I find or we find those things very enriching and very rewarding but equally you know on seeing someone come in and the first time they are too nervous to use the microphone and the second time they manage to you know, mumble a few words and then the third time they you know they say a little bit more than that and then after a while you can't get them to stop talking and even something on that kind of level, which is a really sort of micro um, example of making a difference to someone, those sorts of things are you know, equally rewarding to me um, as when we do something that's kind of bigger and in the public eye and maybe impressive to the outside world. But those, yeah, those small things, I try and really um, remember them and cherish those things. And it keeps, I think it really keeps you humble as well in your work. And that... If you go into it with that approach, then every single day you're going to go home feeling like you had a great day. You're going to feel rewarded, and it's um, it's a real blessing. Great advice, um, Aisha. I think I would also say, like, not to uh, sort of assume that a difference has not been made, because uh, you know it it's a ripple effect, or you know, in that moment you've not seen that difference or change. Um, but further down the line, you know, when when you go backwards, that's when you see that, oh, no, it, the starting point wasn't there. It was actually earlier on. And I think we do sometimes put a lot of pressure on ourselves to, like, oh, this has to be, you know, we have to be able to, of course, measuring change is uh, important. Um, we work a lot around, like, statistics, have the changes been made and, you know, targeted action and, and you know, things like that. But... Yeah, just not to put too much pressure on oneself and just to remember that there is a ripple effect there. And um, yeah, I hear these, again, these conversations, you know, again, just to use key change as an example, when I hear of, uh, I still stay in contact with like a lot of our, uh, you know, old participants and just hearing the uh, what they're doing as well, post key change uh, but using what they learned there and making those changes so although that might not be a direct link to the key change project or whatever it is there you know it's somewhere along the chain so it might not be immediate is what I'm saying yeah I guess working on an impact or on these kind of projects sometimes it can get quite tiring if when you don't see like the change at the speed that you want it so it's good to yeah kind of look back sometimes and remember that the small changes are are really important can I just say, when I was part of Key Change, when I first moved here in 2016, I applied and got in the next year, and I did not know how to navigate the music system here uh, in Berlin. I was very frightened. Um, they just threw me on the stage and never spoke in front of a crowd in a conference, and I was like, oh, I do Mutac. That's really interesting. And they were like, you're doing a presentation. I was like, what the F? You know, and, and they just threw me out in the field in front of like a thousand people, and I was like literally crying. But after doing it and doing it and um, practice, uh, they really encouraged me. Literally, nobody would book me, probably. They're like, who are you? You know, um, you just worked in music tech. Go <laughs> go to, you know, whatever, electronic 
company and do something. Um, and also at factory, they were like, go, you know? And so also learned a lot from you, Graham, like uh, speak on the stage, don't, who cares? You know, just, just test it out, see how it goes, fail and learn and fail and, and keep trying. And, and I think it's important for everyone because once you keep talking, people listen and then I'm pretty sure there's some partnerships will happen in this room tonight. Um, so, you know, you know throw, throw yourself out there, um, p make a good pitch and just ask. Totally. Um, we, at the very beginning, when I was asking, like, why is it important that we use our voices for good, you all kind of referenced media and kind of like the information age. Um, I think that there's no denying that social media can be a double-edged sword and for both like social impact and activism and also for, for artists and creatives, uh, it's an incredibly powerful um, platform. Um, what kind of um, creatives or creators or organizations um, are you guys aware of or do you know that are really leveraging social media in a way um, that, yeah, is kind of on the good side of that, that sword and creating real impact using that platform. Sandera? Refuge Radio, Refuge Worldwide. <laughs> um, for me, there is Karakaya Talks. Um, a friend of mine, Ezra Karakaya, who is just like a, cha she's like very humorous and hilarious, a jokester, but in the end, you see she's talking about uh, what she's doing is discussing without discussing societal topics uh, on racism on colonialism on um, just you know gender inequality and uh, to me she's very you know like a champion in this sense and uh, a media scientist if you will Rich, I um, for me it's always uh, interesting from, from Berlin to uh, See, um, you know, when I was like growing up in London, you know, coming of age, all the rest of it, um, I didn't know the whole like uh, there was a really visceral South Asian uh, dance music scene, if you like, uh, sorry for want of a better phrase, um, which kind of also I think petered out, but I didn't realize uh, that it existed. But now I look at, I think there's a festival called like. Uh, uh, dialed in, decolonized first, and you know their social media is like great. I'm like, I wish I was there. Like, uh, and, and it's you know they've created these uh, uh, communities, uh, you know, and, and they're also open as well, and uh, you know to, for everyone. And there's an inclusivity in there as well for for all. And and yeah, I'm always like sort of blown away by. Um, how you know when you can use uh, social media in a good way and an effective way that you know, you can find your audience or you can find your thing. And uh, yeah, for, for me, that's all, yeah, that was opening up a whole other world again that I didn't know existed and was underground or had a space now to breathe on the socials and therefore the wider world, you know. Uh, the example I always come back to when it's uh, about social media is of a kind of a DJ and well, a person called Elijah in London who started a label called Butters, a grime, a grime label, and who's kind of gone from being a DJ to being like a, I guess, a spokesperson for the, um, the music scene in a way and like a really respected thinker. And um, his, yeah, his Instagram is Elijah with a one instead of the J, I think. And he's just posted these like yellow squares with each, uh, with a sentence on it. And somehow he manages to take with like one sentence just to write the most thought provoking stuff like every day. And I think he also pushes himself to, it's four times a week, um, he pushes himself to write one of these sentences. So it's kind of a very, like a routine thing. And if you go in there, you'll just read these things that kind of blow your mind. Like, why haven't I thought of that before? But it's also just expressed in the most succinct way. And one of them that really got me was like, um, why is radio like this thing, an area where pe we expect people to work for free? And I read that, I was like, shit, you know? Like, no, I, I obviously I've thought about that, but you know, it just the way he kind of wrote that and you, when it's also presented in this really aesthetically um, striking way. And that's just an example that kind of connected with me and made me think about it and how, you know, you can work on that. But for his examples are really connected with the music industry and a lot to do with the, the back end of the music industry, I would say. But just the, generally the ideas um, he shares can be applied to a lot of different things. And then now one that has kind of become a little bit viral, the one that he's made like a print out of is 
close the app, make the thing. So that's sort of like a reference to everything he has been doing, you know? So you can scroll through all these things, but in the end, you need to just close the app and do it yourself. So it's, it's really kind of a self-reflective and just a very interesting place to use a, lose a few minutes scrolling. Awesome. Um, I think that, as mentioned earlier, for us here, community and network is really, really important. I think for all the kind of projects you're working on, the three of you, it's also obviously plays a big role in, in your work. Um, but how do you build a community? How do you create that community? I think um, sometimes that's also something that we, we neglect to talk about. We use community as a buzzword oftentimes, and we, we, we talk about groups of people and the impact and importance of it. But how do you kind of get started? How do you bring people together? Rich? Um, yeah, it is a buzzword, as you say, and it's often a wrongly used buzzword, you know, with people conflating consumers and an audience for a community. And I think that's also maybe a different, a bigger discussion. Um, but yeah, it's important to look at it on different levels as well. There's, we started with an online radio station in January 2021. and. That was kind of that's creating one type of community, right? That's um, getting people to listen online, you know, via social media and other networks. Get, um, just kind of trying to reach them and show them that there's something to listen to online. Then, when we opened the bar and the workshop space and kind of the community hub we, um, and the studio, that created more of a, like a in real life sort of thing, and that was really a big turning point for the station and what we do. Because it's, it's, it went from you know downloading and uploading mixes and um, people just listening from home to people really coming and connecting and meeting each other and also as a programmer it also made it much more interesting for me because I had the opportunity to get people to meet each other who I think should meet each other just by putting them next to each other in the schedule which is always quite a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, ours is I guess ours is really focused around this physical space even though it's very small like the. Yeah, the different activities we do in there, and how that kind of cultivates um, relationships and you know new learnings for people. But it's also definitely really important to recognize another level of community, and that's kind of a more geographical one, and that's you know meaning how you fit into the surroundings um, where you are. And we have you know really international um, sort of following and and community. But it's also just really important to be reflective on, you know, who was in these spaces before. You know, in Neukölln, for example, um, our, most of our radio is in English. You know, we're in Germany, and just being really as aware as possible of how you fit into these things as a wider scale, and just trying to do the best work you can for all three of those levels, not just the ones that you know directly interact with you. Definitely something we always need to be mindful of as kind of people from the international community coming to, to cities. Um, Aisha, how do we build community? Um, it's it's really interesting, like the different uh, levels. So with Keychain, for instance, it's got, you know you can say in a way it's kind of like a formalized uh, way of creating uh, a network or community of people, and uh, that's uh, another level, different level of opportunity there. And then there's you know obviously the the other end of it is the grassroots work that you know a lot of what, what you also do, Richard. Um, and like a like a, a personal another personal story. Um, I, I remember one of my jaunts back to London, and I follow quite a few South Asian uh, Muslim women creatives. Um, again, you know, social media creating spaces for you know representative voices. And uh, so I was just you know scrolling. I was like, oh, there's a South Asian Muslim women creative women's meetup at a tea shop. You know, I just went along to it and. It was incredible, you know, there was someone there that she was on the Netflix writer's room, you know, working on it. Yeah, and someone else has, had created their own, uh, you know, quite a prominent um, uh, newsletter zine thing and like these communities, you know, people being featured in, in, in Vogue and, you know, really, really big things are happening and 
but also being connected to the community that you're also from as well is important. And uh, for me, also, that is important for myself as my part of my identity. And then going back to what you were saying about the whole Berlin thing, um, like I have a lot of guilt sometimes about the English uh, language thing here. And there's been a lot of talk, obviously, in Berlin and in, you know, in general about, um, you know, who are we excluding through language as well? And, you know, how do we go back to tap into that again, being inclusive, uh, you know, in a, in a German sense and actually really seeing who the communities are beyond our sort of bubbles as well. So, yeah. Totally. Sandera? Ooh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, um, I mean, the only anal um, example I can, that I've been thrown into was it here in this space uh, when, when I came here at Factory three and a half, four years ago, was asked to build uh, a community, a creative community. Um, and really the music community is how, through my background, um, really what drove, <laughs> I think, all the creative talks, even to this day in this talk as well. Um, and it was the music community. Um, so, but f in the music community, there's so many barriers as well to break down. And um, I wanted to do something beyond music and invited people who were digital, working in digital arts and creative, and people who were entrepreneurs, and not just musicians. Um, we did a lot of programming while we were here, a lot of mentor talks, um, and we even brought in, you know, intersex artists. Um, what is intersex? Like, uh, maybe some of these startups have no idea, so it was really nice to see that now they have awareness of this and like what is the challenge of an intersex person and um, we're trans um, human and uh, what is a non-binary we had non-binary artists uh, you know talking about you know their challenges um, being non-binary and um, yeah and t to build a community like that through the creative um, starting funneling through music first um, was such a challenge but um, amazing it was a rewarding process as well and um, yeah and uh, especially when they're able to be seen more beyond being a musician that plays now they're a speaker and just like your friend Richard you talked about um, that was inspiring who worked in music as now a spokesperson um, this is also something that um, we wanted to do here with this new community that we built. Um, but yeah, it's such a challenge to build, but you have to program, you have to find prospects, you have to find your interests, yours, um, and talk about everything. I mean, we, we went so broad, we were like talking about SDG goals, the 17 UN SDG goals. And for me now, that's also something that I um, put into my work when I do partnerships. I'm like, are they doing that or whatever? And that's yeah, not the wrong community of partners. I don't want to work with them. And, um, yeah, and I went off on a tangent, sorry. <laughs> that was super interesting, thank you. I guess the, the kind of things that you're saying, are things like shared identity, shared space, shared interest, those are the things that bring us together and we can use those as a foundation for community building. Um, thank you so much. I think I'm going to open it to the floor for some questions now. First of all, thank you very much, everyone. Um, yeah, so now we've got some time for everyone to grill the panel or ask friendly questions. Um, anyone got anything they want to ask? Don't be shy. There we go. Oh, it's all right, you can have this one. Hi, thank you for the talk and the discussion. Um, I guess my question revolves around community and as Rich said, it is like a buzzword and it can be conflated with consumers. And yeah, my question is about what is the sign of a community and to like what end, uh, what, like what, what, what is the purpose of making community what, and what is the sign of like a, I guess, a successful community? Um, yeah. Um. Good question. What is the purpose of a community? <laughs> um, shared beliefs, change. I feel um, gathering this community here too right now is uh, going to learn maybe a thing or two and walk away and hopefully remember it. Um, I think it's important to, to create, I mean, refuge 
worldwide. I keep going back to it because I'm a huge fan and I go to the platform to book artists and find people. Um, that's a community that if it didn't exist, I probably wouldn't have booked people and gotten partnership deals for artists. Um, so they need to exist, you know, and, and it's empowering to see also the curation um, without even um, with the ego and saying like what they're doing, I can see it, you know, and um, it is a community to me that uh, and there's there's several and there's so many in Berlin. I mean, there's a there's a tech community here at Factory, and um, you know, and they're learning from each other and uh, through key change as well. I'm sure you all have many things to say, but without these communities, how can we, you know, um, how can things happen and change? You know, um, it's the trickle effect, it's a network effect, um, and it's it's invisible, but it, I think it's positive and it's necessary. Yeah, and it's also like, you know, the, as an extension of that, like the support and the sharing of opportunity uh, as well, um, you know, uplifting each other. We often, especially with the gender imbalance, uh, uh, we often, you know, women and gender minorities, we're often seen as being in competition with each other, whereas it's not really about that in which it's, it's those attitude shifts as well. Um, and it's not seeing each other as competition, but sharing opportunity. And for me, like, that's really important uh, what community is, it's sharing opportunity, uplifting each other, uh, supporting each other. Um, I think the, the kind of a moment when I know that it is working or I think it is working is actually not when we are um, doing something to uplift or help someone, but when they start doing that for each other. And, uh, you know, Henry, who asked that question, is a you know, great example of this because he's worked with many of the other musicians and people around our station. So when you see that those things are then happening totally independent of your work, just because you have, you know, you've given that a forum to um, to grow, and then they just take it in places you never even uh, could have imagined, that I think is a really sign that it's something you can be proud of. You know, not directly proud of, but indirectly. Um, and then that's kind of the sign of it working. And about the purpose of it, from our perspective, I think a really important part is the feedback and the dialogue and this two-way sort of conversation where um, yeah, we, we are getting feedback from people, what they like, what they don't like, what, what can change. And that, that is really, really important for our work because we, we don't expect that we have all the answers. We're really learning as well. And um, the people around you, even though they may not be experts also on running a radio station, you know, neither are we. So it's uh, just being able to kind of turn to people for some advice or just not even turn to them. They just come and give it to you. The, um, sometimes it is, can be like, ah, okay, like, you're bold, you know, you called me out. But like, <laughs> uh, it's great. You know, you really need that. And you, it keeps you in check. It keeps you accountable. And essentially, that's what you're there for. You know, you're there to, to serve those people. So. It's okay. Anyone else? Well, I actually, I have a question, if no one else has. Um, I quite like the comment of uh, close the app and, and just do it. Um, how, do you, how did you balance or how would you suggest for people starting to balance doing the actual work and ma like making impact, scaling impact? Because th there are almost two, two, two different things and obviously you want to make a difference by doing the work, but how do you prioritize the actual work? I'm a really bad person to answer that because I spend I spend way too much time on these apps, you know. But I think it's also not for no reason because uh, you are you're really absorbing information and learning about people, and there is a reason they exist. So it's I don't think it's a total waste of time. Um, you, you like telling that oh. to yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I don't know, I guess there's also a time when there's going to be a time when it feels right to do that, you know, it's not necessarily that you need to close the app tomorrow after this call and go and say, like, now I'm going to go and make my thing and make a change, you know, it will, it could also be that you keep that app open for a few more years, keep absorbing some more stuff, and then something, you know, something will, an opportunity will drop out of the sky, or you will meet someone, or you will, you know, finally make a breakthrough with something, and then it's your moment as well, so... You, you you got to close the app, but you've got to take your time as well. 